This morning we're going to talk about the message in the meal. For over 2,000 years, the Church of Christ of Jesus has been celebrating the Lord's Supper service. In some churches, it's an elaborate affair that dominates the entire service. Others observe it in random intervals, and others observe it but once per quarter. Some churches observe it every Lord's Day, as we do. However it is observed, the important thing is for those involved to remember why they are doing what they are doing. We need to take time to look at the meal and the message it preaches. This morning affords us such an opportunity. Therefore, I would like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the message in the meal. You see, every time we gather together and partake of the Lord's Supper, we see and participate in a living illustration of the gospel message. This observance continues a message for every person in this room. So let's look into the verses today and hear the message of the meal. When Jesus refers to his broken body in Luke 22, 19, 20, and he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten said, this cup that is poured out for you in the new covenant is my blood. He is referring to the pain he was destined to suffer when he was on the cross. You see, the salvation that we enjoy in Jesus Christ today is free for the taking, but it certainly was not cheap. It cost the Lord Jesus Christ his life on the cross. So let's think for a moment about the death Jesus suffered for us at Calvary. He was beaten in Luke 22, 63, and 64. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? He was scourged. In Luke 23, 16, I will therefore punish and release him. He stood to scourge Jesus before them wearing a crown of thorns and a mock robe. And Pilate told them, Behold the man, in John 19, 5. By this he meant, Look at him now. He will not go around calling himself a king anymore, and he will not cause you any more trouble. However, the mob was not satisfied with only a humiliated Jesus. They demanded his death. He was spit upon. Matthew 27, 30. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. He was mocked, Matthew 27, 26 through 29. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they struck him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and twisted together a crown of thorns, and put on his head and put a reef in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. His beard was plucked out in Isaiah 50 and 6. I give my back to those who struck, and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. He was stripped naked. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And he was nailed to the cross and crucified in Matthew 27, 38. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And John 20 and 25. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my fingers into the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. We cannot even begin to understand the horrors of this kind of death. Still, his body was broken for us at Calvary. 
In Isaiah 53, 4 through 7. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is before the shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus came to this world for that very reason. In John 18, 37. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose... I have came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The very fact that God wore a body is evidence of his love for us. In Philippians 2, 4 through 8. Let each of you look not to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Having this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though... He was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The fact that he was willing that he willingly gave that body on the cross for us says everything that needs to be said about his love for the sinner in Romans 5 5 through 8 and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us for while we were still weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly for one would scarcely die for a righteous person though perhaps for a good person would desire even to die but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what kind of message does this send to us? It is the supreme message that God loves sinners and he gave himself for them on the cross. And that is what we're to remember this morning as we take the bread and place it on our tongues. We've got a message in the payment of his suffering, their sacrifice. Was it not enough for Jesus to have just died? Absolutely not. Jesus had to die through the shedding of his blood. The whole purpose of his death was to provide an atonement for sin. For atonement to take place, blood had to be shed in Hebrews 9:22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Jesus did not come to just cover sin. He came to take sin away in John 1, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In God's economy, blood sacrifice has always been. He himself had set the example for man in Genesis 3:21, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And blood sacrifices was God's law for Israel. In Leviticus 17:11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you to the, on the altar to make atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Through the years, literally millions of animals have been offered as sacrifices, but not a single sin had been paid for. In Hebrews 10, 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But Christ, by his wants for all sacrifice, accomplished that very thing. Hebrews 10, 10 through 14. And by that will we have been sanctified through 
the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be put a footstool at for his feet. For by a single offering he was perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. In Hebrews 9, 7 through 14. But into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offered for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy, the Holy Scripture indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic of the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered. They cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with the food and drink and various washings, regulations of the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, and through the greater and the more perfect tent, not made by hand, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For the blood of goats and bulls, and the sprinkling of the defiled person, and the ashes of heifers, sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purified our conscience from dead work to serve the living God. In Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. What Jesus did when he died was to provide a perfect avenue of salvation for all who would come to him. He gave his blood, which is the only way sin could ever be paid for, and sinners could ever be saved. 1 Peter 1, 18-19 Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And in Romans 1 5, for from Christ Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Let's hear again the words of Luke in 22, 19. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said that what he was about to do on the cross was for you. What he did was to forever satisfy the just demands of God for sin. In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John 2.2 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Romans 3.25 Whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to, the, to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness because he was divine for parents and had passed over former sins. Jesus did not die to pay off the devil. He died to satisfy God. He gave himself in our place so that we might go free from the penalty of sins. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 For her for our sakes he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus suffered the innocent for the guilty, so that the guilty might go free. He took our place. So as we raise the cup of juice to our lips this morning, all we're doing is drinking grape juice. But as you take the juice in your hand and raise it to your mouth, take the time to remember 
That is the reminder of the blood that Jesus shed to save you. This is to be on our thoughts as we take of the Lord's Supper today. A message in the promise, sacrifice. There are promises to the saints. The promise of his resurrection. Jesus is said to be the one who died, but who also is returning. If this is true, then he must be alive. Thank God he is. This is what the Bible says about Jesus being alive. On Matthew 28, 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. And he said, Come see the place where he lay. In John ten eighteen, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Hebrews seven twenty five. Consequently, he is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him, since he has always lived to make intercessions for them. We are to remember that this Savior who died on the cross is alive and well today. The promise of his return. We are also to remember his promise that he is returning to this world someday to receive his people unto himself. In John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18 But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Christ, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For, the, for this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore encourage one another with these words. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will rise in perishable, and we shall be changed. Jesus is returning, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. The promise of a rehearsal. We all know that God has called his people to be witnesses of him. In Mark sixteen fifteen, he said to them, But who do you say I am? In Matthew twenty eight, nineteen and twenty, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you, always to the end of the age. And Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I hope we're doing that. 
But however, when we gather in this place and partake of the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity to make a united corporate statement concerning our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our observance of this meal is an opportunity to tell others about his death, his resurrection, his return, and his invitation to them to come to him for salvation. We have heard the message in the meal. Now it's time to heed the message and respond to it. For the Lord's people, it is time to examine our hearts. In verses 27 through 32, which Daniel has read to us, reflects the implications that Paul sees when, he, when the true meaning of the supper is as it is applied to the Corinthian situation. It is a very serious matter to go through the motions of the supper together in a state of disharmony and division. Contextually, eating and drinking in an unworldly manner refers to the divided way in which the Corinthians were coming together. This is reinforced in verses 33 and 34. There is such a vital, organic connection between Christ and the people, body of the people on earth, that to eat and drink the supper when the church is in a divided state is to sin against the body and blood of the Lord. You cannot sin against the brotherhood without sinning against Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 12. Thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience. When he is weak, you sin against Christ. This self-examination is in order that we view toward maintaining and not violating the unity of the Bible body that is mandatory in the remembrance of this meal. Various visitations of God upon the saints occurred here because of their selfish, loveless action that resulted in body divisions in 1130. Godly repentance is in order that the body would be healed and again reflect the oneness Christians have in Christ in 1131 and 32. But in verses 33 and 34, Paul returns to where the problem began with some concluding remarks. Again, Paul assumed the priority of their coming together to eat in 1133. But in such meetings, there must wait until all have gathered before they eat in 1133 also. If some are hungry and cannot wait, they should fill up at home. This would ensure that the public gathering, the people would be one at the table and not divided by early eaters who thus left no others with nothing. So let us be sure that we have dealt with our sins and our failures. It is time for us to bow before the Lord in repentance and humility as we ask him to prepare us to meet him at the table. And in conclusion, the promises given to the sinner. Implied in the message of the Lord's Supper is an invitation for lost people to turn from their sin to embrace the Savior. After all, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his second coming are all for the purpose of accomplishing redemption for the lost sinners. So if you are lost, the cross was for you. The empty tomb is for you. God's invitation to you is to come to him and be saved. In Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John 6, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And Acts 16, 31. And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. If you are lost and in need of a Savior, I invite you to come to Jesus Christ today. The door is open and the way is clear if you want to come to Jesus. You need not fear that he will turn you away. In John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever's come to me, I will not cast out. I've got a little illustration here. I want to say the title of it is Salvation is Free, But It Must Be Received. Back in 18 and 30, George Wilson was convicted of robbing the U.S. mail and was sentenced to be hanged. 
President Andrew Jackson issued a pardon for Wilson, but he refused to accept it. The matter went to Chief Justice Marshall, who concluded that Wilson would have to be executed. A pardon is a slip of paper, wrote Marshall, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. The moral of this story is, for some people, the pardon comes too late. For others, the pardon is never accepted. For any lost person who might be here today, it is time for you to consider your destiny. Do you want to go to heaven when you die? If you have never been saved, you can receive forgiveness and salvation through the blood of Jesus today if you will come to him. That's my message this morning, and a will come for the Lord's Supper table.